Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This Wednesday, we're going to talk a little bit about Zephaniah, uh, particularly chapter 2. We're coming up on the uh, spiritual new year, March 12. There's a lot going on, so much so that it's really overwhelming to even talk about. I guess unless you're one of those people that just kind of goes through life not thinking about anything spiritual, anything prophetic, uh, I think we've come way past the point of looking for signs. <laughs> I mean, really, come on. I mean, honestly, uh, we had the Revelation 12 sign in 2017 as well as the first great American solar eclipse. We're coming up on the second one, April 8th, with this uh, all-important election here in the U.S. Uh, this year, 2024. With everything else that's going on, with all of the everything, I'm sure, if, look, you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then it wouldn't do me any good at all to try to lay that out for you. We are living in a very interesting time. That's the, the least you could say about it. I asked Sue uh, this morning if she thought that I was kind of reaching, you know, look, sort of looking for things that aren't there just because I want them to be there. And, and I asked her if, she, if uh, she thought I was looking at all this honestly, and she, she of course, well, naturally, she said she didn't. She said she thought that I was uh, not doing that. I, I wasn't, you know, going too far out on a limb. I don't, folks. I don't think. And this is just my opinion. That anyone could put up a very good argument about us not being nearing the end of this present age of grace. I understand there's a few de denominations out there that uh, you couldn't convince them if the, I don't think if, uh, if the Lord was seen coming in the cloud. And I understand there's all, also the opposite extreme. There are those who see things that aren't there. One of the most important uh, missions, I, I guess you'd say, of this channel has always been just to look at the facts honestly and leave it to the viewers to decide. So I'm always putting facts out there. I'm always, uh, what I think I believe are facts or that can be easily confirmed as, as facts. And, and again, that's, that brings up a whole issue of you know, well, what is fact today? I mean, you know, what's truth is, it's, uh, it's sort of, it's irrelevant. It's not absolute, you know. Uh, I, for one, actually believe in absolute truth. And that truth being the Word of God. If you look on a map of the Middle East today, uh, If you look and see where the biblical Ekron is, it's right inside Gaza. So is Ashdod, so is Ashkelon, Gaza, all along the seacoast, with, you know, Joppa up north. We're going to look at a mention by the prophet Zephaniah of the Moabites, the Moabite people. They, they originally, they shared an ancestry with Israel, though they weren't monotheistic, one God only, they were polytheistic. And uh, we know that from Judges chapter 10. They were pagans, they primarily worshiped a, a God called Chamash, uh, which we 
re can read about in Numbers chapter 21. Zoar, which is a, a shelter in the mountains of the, that's a Moabite city. The Moabites, they were often at war with Israel and it was basically because of their differing beliefs, but Chamash, the god that they worshiped, the name means destroyer, is what the name means. Hamas means violence. Chamash means destroyer. The original Moabite tribe it no longer exists today. It was conquered by the Babylonians in 583 BC. Uh, so we don't find any records of them. The Moab land today is now known as the country of Jordan. Uh, even though, even though the modern day Jordanians, they don't share any similarities with the, the, the to to the Moabites as the, you know, the majority of the people living uh, in Jordan, however they are Muslim. And that's all I'll say about that, except that Ruth was a Moabite until she converted. Now, we'll, we'll read a verse of there in, in Zephaniah, I've, I've heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the Ammonites who have taunted my people and threatened their borders. Um, so Moab, Ammonites, uh, descendants of Lot, that's the modern day Jordanians, Syrians, primarily, but uh, If you start at verse 4 in chapter 2 of Zephaniah, for Gaza will be abandoned. And Ashkelon left in ruins. Ashdod will be driven out at noon and Ekron will be uprooted. Woe to the dwellers of the seacoast, O nation of the Cherethites. Cherethites. Well, who's the Cherethites? Well, King David had a bodyguard who was a Cherethite. They were taken from a select group within the, the group of, of Palestinian, of Philistines, Philistines, which are Palestinians. That, that's, that interests me because, you know, here David, he, he takes on this, you know, he hires basically a bodyguard. Israel wants to trust its neighboring borders to not attack them. Woe to the dwellers of the seacoast, O nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you. They're against you. O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you and no one will be left. Verse 6, so the seacoast will become a land of pastures with wells for shepherds and folds for sheep. The coast will belong to the remnant of the house of Judah, for they will find pasture. They'll make use of that land. They will lie down in the evening among the houses of Ashkelon. Lie down in the evening among the houses of Ashkelon. For the Lord their God will attend to them and restore their captives and 
it's almost like I'm reading today's headlines. Now, this is found, all of this is in, it's in the context of, in fact, Zephaniah, short three chapters, is, uh, it's one of the main themes is the day of the Lord. That phrase, day of the Lord, is often misunderstood. Uh, there are varying different beliefs. If you know, you you've got a lot of choices to choose from. If if you want to, you can believe that day of the Lord means the rapture. Well, it just means the rapture, Steve. I'm day waiting for the day of the Lord, and that's the rapture. And it's just a single event. That's the day of the Lord. Well, because a day, a twenty-four hour period. Problem is, the phrase day is a, is an age, a period, not just a twenty-four hour period. And it's much more inclusive than that. There are those who believe that the day of the Lord, and I've done videos on this in the past. It's been several years, but uh, you can take the view that that's, that begins at the rapture, and, uh, well, it, it goes all the way through the, to the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's the day of the Lord. Well, that happens to be my view but let me give you another one. It's just the tribulation period only. You know, it kind of begins with the rapture. Doesn't it's not really describing the rapture, but it's it's really just describing the tribulation period. I believe strongly that scripture points out that phrase, uses that phrase in the context of a period which begins at the rapture and ends, at, le at least ends after the, the thousand year reign of Christ. I'm not sure if, if, if it doesn't, the phrase day of the Lord doesn't extend all throughout eternity, but that's, you know, there's the eternal state, which may be distinct and different from that day of the Lord as I understand it, which begins at the rapture, okay? There are those who say the day of the Lord begins with just the return of Jesus Christ. The second coming has nothing to do with the tribulation period or the rapture. It's just describing the second coming of Christ and or, well, including the thousand year reign of Christ. So there's, there's different views. Uh, I haven't studied, studied it uh, for years. I having studied that for years, I, I see it used in the context of a period beginning with the tribulation period, which would have to include the rapture, and ending at the thousand year reign of Christ. That's the day of the Lord. Now you have the phrase day of Christ used often too. That's, that's a different phrase. It's to be distinguished you know, primarily, I believe that, that that refers to the thousand year reign and perhaps beyond. But day of the Lord is a very distinct, unique phrase. We know we're coming up on the second eclipse. We know that uh, there's uh, also going to be a, a devil comet visible during that eclipse. It's not often uh, that a, a, a bright comet near the sun, uh, you know, shows up during a total eclipse. But that's what's going to happen on April 8th. So what was Zephaniah, you know, really talking about? He predicts the downfall of the Assyrian Empire, but unlike Isaiah, he doesn't anticipate the, the resurgence of peace and righteousness in Jerusalem. He predicts, Zephaniah predicts a day of judgment. It'll sweep across the entire face of the earth uh, like a firestorm, and it'll purge it from evil. He also warns, Zephaniah warns the surrounding nations, the other nations, uh, of their impending judgment in chapter 2. 
but there is uh, there is this very strong message that comes around before you, before your face, that kind of blows up in your face as you're looking at these three chapters that you can't mess with God's people and expect to get away with it. This uh, word came to Zephaniah during his reign, just Josiah's reign, uh, 640 to 609 BC, somewhere around there. Uh, he couldn't. He couldn't have ministered that to the northern kingdom because it fell in 722 BC. So Zephaniah's audience cons basically consisted of the people of Judea, the surviving southern kingdom. Uh, all this to say, well, if someone was to message me and say, "Steve, well, I mean, so is is this has this already been fulfilled?" Are we waiting for this to be fulfilled? We can only be waiting for it to be fulfilled. We can only be looking at it as future, not something that's already been fulfilled. Now, uh, I got a list of names here, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, in verse 4, you've got Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, all in Gaza, all along the seacoast, verse 5. The land of the Philistines, Philistines is Palestinians. Uh, I've often mentioned that, my belief at least, that the wheels of prophecy turn slowly. Okay, I'm not expecting some event April 8th when the eclipse occurs. That's I made the mistake back in 2017 of thinking that just maybe this Revelation 12 sign might be an event. It turned out to be a sign, not an event. And I think that this, we are told that there would be signs in the sun, moon, and stars before the Lord returned, dearly beloved. That is also in the context of the day of the Lord in Luke 21. And note what he mentions first. Sun. Signs in the sun. The sun. Well, we had the Revelation 12 sign. We had the solar eclipse there right before it in August of 2017. And we're coming up on a second eclipse here. Well, Steve, prophecy, all this stuff, none of this has anything to do with America, says one guy. The, on, on my left here, the guy on my right says, all this has to do with America, and it's not Middle Eastern. And Folks, this is Middle Eastern centric, without a doubt. Now, you can't read Zephaniah and not see that. Does all nations mean all nations? Well, of course, it does. Gentiles, Gentile nations. That's, it's, you know, Gentiles. That's any nation other, other than Israel. Which is interesting because if there is if replacement theology were true and that you know the church has replaced Israel, then that wouldn't make any sense. But you know, things today seem to that don't make a lick of sense to me seem to make a whole lot of sense to a lot of other people. And that's probably vice versa. I, you know, I I'm trying to speak humbly here. I'm I am not the anybody's guru that's for certain i'm not the the oracle of all truth i just i love looking at the facts of everything i always have i mean it i could take you outside the the realm of Bible study research and other things in which I just love looking at facts. I'm not a big fan of farce, okay? I'm just not. Uh, I think we should all place a tremendous value on truth.
Zephaniah chapter 1. I, I'm going to just read a little bit out of the Berean Study Bible. I'll completely sweep away everything from the face of the earth. I'll sweep away man and beast. I'll sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the idols of their wicked worshipers. I'll cut off mankind from the face of the earth. That's, man, that is, wow. I mean, gosh, man. Steve, how could you worship a God like that? <laughs> because he's going to destroy evil and create a new heavens and earth, and new earth. But there's some things that have to happen first. I'll stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who dwell in Jerusalem. I'll cut off from this place every remnant of Baal, the names of the idolatrous and pagan priests, those who bow down, those who bow on the rooftops to worship the host of heaven. Those who bow down and swear by the Lord, but also swear by Milcom. Now, I'm, I'm not going to tell you who Milcom is. Those who turn back from following the Lord, neither seeking the Lord nor inquiring of Him. I'm not sure Jews get down and pray. Do, do they? Sue? I've, I've, I've never seen a Muslim stand and pray, really. Not really, uh, except maybe to holler out, you know, something. I'm try Folks, I'm trying hard not to read stuff into this. And I understand that we are along, we are, you know, 3,000 years away from just about from this. Uh, but verse 7, be silent in the presence of the Lord God for the day of the Lord is near. He mentions, Zeph Zephaniah mentions this day, this phrase, day of the Lord, several times, a number of times, in fact. Indeed, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated His guests. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the princes, the sons of the king, and all who are dressed in foreign apparel. On that day, I will punish all who leap over the threshold, who fill the house of their master with violence and deceit. Violence and deceit today rules this present gener age, generation, this period in which we're in. I don't care whether you're talking about things spiritual or you're talking about things political. And I will admit that you, you could argue, well, Steve, that's, yeah, it's happened before in the past. We're not in the past. We are, we're here today where we are. Uh, and you know what? We've worked hard to get here, folks. All right? Mankind has worked hard to get to this, to where we're at. All right? But there is a day of reckoning that is coming and may be upon us as, we, as I speak. I remember many years ago, Billy Graham, I believe it, or at least, at least it was reported that he said that if God didn't punish America, he would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. All your merchants will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. And at that time, I'll search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men settled in complacency who say to themselves, the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Well, you know, we're used to the term, well, where's the promise of His coming? Their wealth will be plundered and their houses laid waste. They will build houses but not inhabit them, who plant vineyards but never drink their wine. The great day of the Lord is near dash near you near twice in a row the word near dash near that's of course I'm reading from Brian's 
study Bible, but and coming quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord, exclamation point. Then the cry of the mighty will be bitter. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of, of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of horn blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the high corner towers. I will bring such distress on mankind that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath. The whole earth will be consumed by the fire of God's jealousy. For indeed, he will make a sudden end of all who dwell on the earth. But we're promised a new heaven and a new earth. You know, you gotta, you gotta wonder, you know, I mean, how many, how many, how many millions, billions of people down through all the centuries have sat around pondering, you know, this time. Have we, dearly beloved, have we become so sort of indoctrinated, so used to the idea that just really that we may be that final generation that sees our Lord return, that, that it's just become, well, it's sort of lost its, its shine. We, we tend to underestimate the glory, the value of it. To be privileged to live at a time in which we're living. I do not think, and you know, I, I hate even using that expression. You know, it doesn't matter what I think. But, Again, Gaza will be abandoned. Ashkelon, left in ruins. Ashdod, driven out at noon. Ekron, uprooted. Woe to the dwellers of the seacoast. O nation of the Cherethites, the word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you and no one will be left. Someone else takes possession of this land. The coast will belong to the remnant of the house of Judah. Don't expect that next week. I, I Really, I well, how do I know? But uh, folks, this is going someplace. Now look, you got, is, as I see it, we have two choices. Basically, we got there's two ways we can go on this. We can say that, well, maybe it's there to, I don't know, maybe, Steve, maybe God put this here to excite every generation and then God just, all he has to do is throw in something in that generation to make them feel like that they're at that point. I'm, folks, do you really believe that? Nothing really could move forward prophetically until Israel became a nation again in 1948. Almost every Christian I know understands that. You got the judgment of uh, Moab and Ammon, judgment on Cush and Assyria. The Assyrians. It's 
spend some time looking at who that is today. We get down to uh, get over to the third chapter. It talks about the purification of the nations. A faithful remnant. Israel's restoration. There is a happy ending to all of this. And dearly beloved, that is our blessed hope. Thank you for taking time to listen. Keep looking up because I believe we are going home soon and rest in Him. Rest in the truth that His work was sufficient on your behalf and that He loves you dearly. We love you too. Until next time, thanks for watching.